Climate change topped the policies of the Green Party of Canada way before it became one of the it issues during this election campaign. But their platform ranges far and wide beyond that. Here to make her party's pitch is Elizabeth May. She is leader of the Green Party of Canada and candidate for Sanich Gulf Islands in British Columbia. And she joins us now. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a thrill to meet you. Oh, you're kind. Um, and we're going to get a chance to speak about your platform, but I noticed that pin that you're wearing. What is yeah. that pin? Well, one is the Order of Canada, but the other one, this beautiful uh, rainbow pin, is a representation of the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, mm -hmm. which Canada has signed on to and which they all fall due in 2030. Mm -hmm. But they apply to Canada and globally. So this is an exciting decade, because if you believe in the work, and I believe in the work, mm -hmm. we can eliminate poverty in Canada and globally by 2030, have clean drinking water and gender equity and all the pieces. But this little, this little pin, a lot of our candidates wear it. As a it, reminder? Yeah, we're committed. Um, we're going to talk more about 2030 in a few moments. Yeah. Um, but at the very beginning, I mentioned how, you know, um, climate change has been an issue for your party yeah. way before it became something yeah. that everybody spoke uh, spoke about. And a few years ago, during uh, 2015, uh, the election cycle, you were here speaking to Steve, yeah. and you actually said that um, you were a bit frustrated, if that's the right word to use. Um, you said climate change was the election issue back then, but it yes. wasn't being talked about. Yeah. Um, things have changed. Yeah. Do you take any credit for moving the need on that discussion? I don't want to take credit for anything. I've been working on the climate crisis issue since 1987. And if I'm playing any role at all, I'm a failure. We've missed, we've missed targets. We've, things are so much worse now. Mm -hmm. So I think if you take credit, you also take responsibility. And I know one climate activist can't really be responsible, but I don't feel like taking credit. I am so angry all the time that we missed the chance to avoid where we are now. We signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, and our emissions have gone up since instead of down. Mm -hmm. And I finally came to the conclusion that the biggest obstacle we have is partisan politics and short-term incremental thinking, which is endemic throughout the other political parties. And it's, so I'm trying to change the way we talk about climate by saying it's not political, it's a science discussion. Base your policies and your goals in the science mm -hmm. and let's talk about it in a way, which is hard in an election, mm -hmm. that is as nonpartisan as possible. Because it's a lot of emotions, uh, emotions are higher. Um, and But to do the work that you've been doing, you mentioned you've been doing it for several decades now. Yeah. What pushed you, what inspired you, what um, led you to fight for this? That's a very interesting question for which I don't have a good answer. I, from my very youngest days, my, my mom remembered a story that she used to tell people that when I was about two and a half, I looked up at the sky and said, I, said, I, I, I hate airplanes. And I'd never been in one at that point. My mom said, well, well, you know, why would you hate airplanes? Mm -hmm. And I said, apparently, because they scratch the sky. So something about me from my infancy, very close to, uh, to um, non-human species that I loved, close to pets, close to animals, close to the ground. And by the time I was in grade 10, I had decided that what I wanted to do with my life was be an environmental lawyer and protect uh, human health, protect life on Earth. So it's, it's a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know why, but I haven't changed at all, except that I'm obviously way older. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were, you were a lawyer by trade. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point, you wanted to become an Anglican priest. Yeah. It was after 17... Well, I've been executive director of Sierra Club of Canada for probably 12 or 13 years. I ended up being executive director for 17 years. But around the point that I thought, this organization needs new leadership, we need succession planning. Mm -hmm. Then it came to me, what do I want to do next? Do I want to go back to practicing law? That didn't appeal to me. I can't just go run another environmental group because that's sometimes where people move to mm -hmm. because that just felt like, why would I do that? It didn't feel like something that was a challenge or that another organization would need an older leader. So I, the only thing that really occurred to me, I remember having a conversation with my mom actually where I said, you know, I, I know I don't want to practice law, but I don't want to do this, and I know I don't want to go into politics. I think the thing that actually would be a good move for me as a going into my older years woman without any savings, what appeals to me is the life of an Anglican priest where I can be of service mm. and find a, a place where I'm fulfilled because I do get filled by faith and it helps me a lot. But instead, <laughs> while I was studying for the priesthood, Stephen Harper became prime minister by accident, as far as I felt, in 2006. And I realized, 
oh boy, we're in trouble. Now I really do need to enter the political fray, even though it wasn't it wasn't uh, my first choice. Well, let's talk about uh, politics. Yeah. Um, if you released your platform, mm -hmm. and in the Green Party's platform, you kick it off by describing what you hope Canada will look like in 2030. Yeah. We kind of touched on it, but yeah. why 2030? Well, it's actually the image that we had for the, for the platform was that it's basically, if you have a jigsaw puzzle, it's like a jigsaw puzzle with little pieces out on the table, you know you have all the pieces of the puzzle. You can solve this puzzle. But if you don't have the picture on the top of the box, your family gathered around the table is going to have a much harder time. So we feel like, okay, this is the picture on the top of the box. Mm -hmm. This is what Canada is going to look like in 2030. 2030 is significant because it's the end point for the SDG goals, but more significantly because it's science-based and not aspirational. It is required that by 2030 we reduce emissions globally by about half. Canada has been such a laggard for the last number of, well, more than a decade, that we need to reduce by 60% against 2005 levels by 2030 to, pl to play our responsible role as a major polluter and as an industrialized country, and frankly, as a country that still has a lot of respect in the world. If we got our own house in order domestically mm -hmm. to reduce emissions and stop uh, using fossil fuels altogether, start ramping down the oil sands and showing that we're serious about moving to 100% renewable energy, that will give us a lot more credibility globally in negotiations to ensure that every other country does the same. Well, how will the transition between the world that we live in now and the world where we get to where these levels roll out? Well, we've lost a lot of time, which with, through procrastination, as I mentioned earlier, between 1992 and now, our emissions just kept going up. We had a bit of a dip around the 2008 recession. What we need to do is set the right target, the current target, which gets referred to even in national media where people should know better. They still call it the Paris target, mm -hmm. but it's inconsistent with what we committed to do in Paris, which is to hold global average temperature at a level which we can survive. Mm -hmm. Now, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report last October, underlined this mm -hmm. with um, neon lights. Really, I'm going to mix my metaphors between underlining ne neon lights, but the alarm bells are ringing. Mm -hmm. And we still have politics as usual, status quo decision making. So the first step is to say, we have to double our target. Mm -hmm. We have to know that by 2030, we've slashed emissions by 60%. Now, we've put all our background scenario documents online. People who are really deeply into the weeds can go, look, how many trees do you plan to plant a year? How fast can you ramp up a national electricity grid mm -hmm. to ensure that every part of this country can access 100% decarbonized renewable energy electricity? And then by 2030, we can stop selling internal combustion engines and people will be relying on vehicles that don't use fossil fuels, homes that don't need heating with fossil fuels and so on. So we make the steps in a logical sequence mm -hmm. uh, in a way that isn't disruptive to our economy, but is transformative. Well, what do you say to Canadians who are concerned about climate change and maybe want to vote uh, for the Green Party, but they're also concerned about the transition period and yeah. their place in it? Well, we are, this is all hands on deck. There's a role for every Canadian. There's a role for every order of government, municipal, local governments, indigenous governments, First Nations, Métis, Inuit. All of us, and volunteers, civil society, we need to pull together. And with leadership from the prime minister, and I, there's still a chance I could be prime minister. That's the best outcome. Mm -hmm. But let's be realistic. If, if we have a minority parliament, as many Greens as possible elected can push others to agree that this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We need to take partisanship out of it. So we're calling for the equivalent of a war cabinet mm -hmm. to ensure every party leader is by consensus agreed how do you, to changes. I mean, in a, an ideal world, that mm -hmm. is something that could happen. But right. you've, met, you've mentioned partisan politics a mm -hmm. couple of times. Um, and I also wonder if some of this science for the average voter, they might not be able to comprehend uh, yeah. the science. And again, it's that, you know, we know what's what today looks like, but having, um, how do you, how do you translate that message to just like the average voter? See, I think the average voter is way ahead of the average party leader, mm -hmm. honestly. If you look at since the 1990s, in polling, Canadians have at a level of 80% pretty consistently been asking for climate action. The fact that we had hundreds of thousands of people on the streets across Canada, half a million in Montreal alone, tens of thousands in Toronto, 100,000 in Vancouver, 
on the Friday of the climate strike, September 27th, I don't think the average voter needs to become a climate Nobel Prize winning scientist to understand that this is an emergency. But why isn't that translating into the people that they're electing to represent them? That's the question. And I think it's because uh, political party leadership and their backroom strategists have forever on almost any issue analyzed it with what's the least we have to do to get through this and still look good, mm -hmm. as opposed to what is the science telling us we have to do? So people look at our plan, Mission Possible. They say, wow, that's ambitious. Well, yeah, because the science is telling us, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report said, to make the changes we need to make across the world, the global economy, this is a Herculean effort. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but it's possible. And therefore, we have to do it. So the changes for our society, I mean, for Canadians to make the decision that, OK, it's going to be more affordable for me in 10 years to have an electric vehicle that I plug into my house. And no, I don't think I'll miss going to the gas station. And yes, we're going to build up new jobs in a new economy. And for instance, the number of people we will need who are carpenters, electricians, and plumbers mm -hmm. to ensure that our built infrastructure stops wasting energy. Uh, the effort we need to make to plant trees, to have more local sustainable agriculture. These are all positive changes in the way we live. It will reduce air pollution. There are co-benefits that make us healthier, mm -hmm. and yet, and this is really a question for a psychiatrist to understand, or those who delve deep into why humans think the way we do. We seem to have a more predominant narrative of being afraid of the changes we have to make to ensure we avoid disaster. We're more afraid of the solutions than we are of the disaster. That's very strange. But Greens will continue, all of our candidates across the country. I'm so proud of the, every single one of the Green candidates who's stepping up. Mm -hmm. Because we have to keep saying, we have to face facts, we have to listen to the science, and we should not be afraid. This is a hopeful course to a better future. Well, Aaron Kelly, CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc., was on the program last Friday speaking with Steve Pakin, and her artificial intelligence pollster, Polly, scans what Canadians are saying about the election. Uh, here she is talking about climate change. Let's take a look. People on the left who we typically associate with environmental issues do not see climate change as uh, an, an issue of injustice or inequality, which is really what the left is concerned about. So when we look at uh, environment bipartisanship, and of course this is including climate change, what's really interesting is we see people on the far left and the far right less engaged on the environment, including climate change, than people in the center. So this has really become a centrist issue. And because it's a centrist issue, you have to approach it differently as a politician. So you see Elizabeth May right now, she's coming out with a very left-wing um, campaign promises. But this issue is more of a center issue, and therefore it is playing better for liberal conservatives because it's a centrist issue. Um, when she said left wing, uh, your eyebrows went out. But yeah. given what Aaron Kelly said, why does the Green Party ref reflect issues that are traditionally on the left of the spectrum? Well, we have six core green values, just to back up a bit. The Green Party exists in 80 countries around the world, and the only thing that unites us, because, for instance, the Green Party of Ontario and the magnificent Mike Schreiner, whom I love to bits, who's the MPP for Guelph, brilliant. And people vote for him who used to vote Conservative, and people vote for him who used to vote NDP, and they used to vote Liberal, because what, what he's advancing is common sense and speaks to people's values. So what unites us isn't any structure or financing scheme or top-down organization. All around the world, Greens are united by six core values. One of them is social justice. One of them is respect for diversity. So while we don't want to be painted left or right, because frankly, I think those terms are antiquated, we're now... Well, I mean, when you consider the US election, there was a point where when Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton were in the nomination struggle, I heard voters in the U.S. interviewed who would say, well, I'm a Bernie supporter now, but if Hillary gets it, I'm voting for Trump. Mm -hmm. So you sort of pick yourself up off the floor. So what does that mean? And I think it means that we're more in a world of the billionaire class versus the rest of us, insiders and outsiders. So left and right doesn't exist. Then. That's how we feel. But now, also, we believe very firmly that you cannot achieve what needs to be done for the climate without social justice running through the core of everything you do. Mm -hmm. So we're committed to just transition. We're very committed to workers and making sure they don't feel insecure as we make this transformation. You just used the US example. Do you, know, do you think that applies to Canada? 
I think there is definitely an insider outsider aspect to our politic, which is very different from left or right. And I, I do know that there's some people who are critical because we're not prepared to attack capitalism. Well, I have a lot of problems with capitalism, but I know one thing. If we're approaching this sequentially, mm -hmm. we don't have time to get rid of capitalism to ensure we have climate justice. And also, there are a lot of very smart entrepreneurs and business people who, once the, the political will is clear, and they realize, OK, we're not going to weasel out of this. We're going off fossil fuels for good mm -hmm. and 60 percent less by 2030. Investment dollars will flow to where they should be, which is in solar, in wind, in geothermal, in district energy, in all the things we can do that avoid our, well, basically wean us off our addiction to fossil fuels. Your platform has some big promises yeah. that are going to cost billions of dollars. Yeah. How do you plan to pay for all that? Well, we've also, in the platform, found billions of dollars more than we have now. Where? Uh, in a and these are planks that we put forward to the Parliamentary Budget Office and ask them, what do you think we'll get from this? We also, by the way, we had some sticker shock when we saw what PBO thought Pharmacare would cost. But we know that Pharmacare will long-term save our economy a lot of money. It's We have to do it. It is expensive. So we found money in, for instance, increasing the tax on larger transnational corporations, big business, adjusting the tax to what it is in the U.S. at 21 percent instead of its current 15. We're looking at a financial transaction tax. Canada's been talking about this for decades. Some people think of it as the Tobin tax, but a transaction tax on large transactions of 0.5 percent. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at, at closing some of the loopholes, the stock option loophole, the capital gain loophole, and a wealth tax on those that have more than 20 20 million dollars in wealth. You add a plus, I should say, we're also looking at taxing the e-commerce outfits, the Netflix and Googles and Facebooks. By the time you look at the revenue we're taking in, a small tax on sugary drinks to make sure our children's health is improved, you add all those up. And even with our spending commitments for universal child care, for pharmacare, for uh, abolishing tuition so that kids can afford an education, you take all those together and unless we have a recession or some reason to change our direction, we're balancing the budget by, by in five years. And that's all demonstrable and all online. Well, you mentioned taxes a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't have to tell you that whenever people hear taxes, you know, it's not something that they... I want. love paying taxes. As a member of parliament, I now pay more in taxes than I used to earn when I was in the environmental movement. And it's an honor and a privilege to pay taxes but how to do a you civilized get, country. But how do you get people to, how do you get people on side with that? I think the message has to be that we are all on the same side here. Mm. Your government is at the end of your fingertips delivering on democracy. Citizens have to take control. And I think we've been alienated from our government. I think it's really been the neoliberal mantra since the Reagan-Thatcher years. We have really lost track of the idea, particularly for anyone who's a lot younger than me. I'm 65, and I remember the idea that our government was working with us and for us. Mm. We've had a very large alienation that's been deliberately manipulated by the right, let's be clear. The idea that big government is bad, that, that deregulation is a good thing to do, that it's better to have trade liberalization and export your, and, and, and put your jobs overseas, so outsourcing. The idea that an economy should serve citizens, that government should serve citizens, that this is about the well-being of all, is a different message than that that framing that instead of talking about us as citizens for the last number of decades we've been talked about as consumers which is very transactional and as taxpayers which is very transactional as opposed to people living in a civilized society and thank goodness we have our health care system i'm glad i don't have to build my own sidewalk in front of my apartment because we actually pay taxes to get that stuff done for us i think we need to shift the discourse to say to get through the climate crisis we need a functional democracy where citizens are in charge and we get big oil out of the decision making. And that really is leading to a more engaged, participatory democracy. Uh, I only have a few minutes, but I want to get some more questions in. Yeah. Kevin Page, the former par parliamentary budget officer, uh, ran the math on your platform and found some major gaps in it. Um, how do you respond to his statement that the numbers just don't add up? Well, he said at this time, and what happened was he hasn't gotten the back, he, ha he now has all our background papers, and he is regrading it. Unfortunately, what got issued to the media was kind of a simplified version of, here's the revenue, mm -hmm. 
Here's the expenditures. See, it balances. And what he needs, of course, is what's your risk assessment of what happens if our current trajectory, and right now the federal government has quite sustainable numbers into the future. Provinces, not so much. We can actually, with the interest rates where they are now, what we really need is investment. The platform we're putting forward actually meets all those goals and was developed with an eye on risk, mm -hmm. but those documents weren't sent to the Institute for Fiscal Issues and Democracy at U of O. They now have been sent there, and I'm quite confident that very soon Kevin Page will give us a different mark. Um, at the beginning of the interview, you said that uh, your platform is not an aspirational document. Right. Um, and I've also seen you in a few interviews say, or joke, that you know that you're not going to be prime minister. But you know what? I really would like to be. I'm the best well, qualified. It does seem unfair. But this is, when you, <laughs> but when you say that, and maybe it's just to deflect, I don't know, um, but when you say that, um, how do you then convince people to uh, vote for Green Party candidates? Well, we're very likely to be headed into a minority parliament. And the last thing we need in a minority parliament is teams that act like sports teams that won't work together. We desperately need Greens elected to this parliament to make things work better for everyone because we are different. We do politics differently. Mm. I'm very comfortable working across party lines. I get attacked by the New Democrats because I said I'd be willing to talk to the Conservatives. Yeah. It might be a short conversation, but the point is in a minority parliament, the job of every party leader is to talk to all the other party leaders and the individual members of parliament. Well, you said that you you do politics differently, but there's been some controversy during this election uh, cycle around your party. Mm -hmm. um, there was that issue, a uh, photoshopped cup that you were holding, um, controversies with some Green Party candidates. Is there anything that you would have done, uh, you would have approached differently? Well, no, because as leader of the Green Party of Canada, I'm extremely proud of our platform. Controversies that are drummed up during an election campaign, I think most voters say, well, that's kind of weird. I frankly had no idea anyone had taken a compostable cup out of my hand to put a different cup with a logo on it. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been carried. There was no reason to do that, right? The original photo had nothing I wanted covered up. So I'm, it's an absurdity that in the middle of an election campaign where we have serious issues to discuss, most interviews end up talking about photoshopping as if it's somehow a great black mark well, against the Greens. Well, no, I think it also, it's, I, I think uh, maybe the concern is that if that's, if, if, if someone is, cons will lie about something that's No one's so, lying about anything. Or change, well, you know, the said, optics, uh, then what else would they do if they're in power, right? As, I think it's fair. Well, as leader of the Green Party of Canada, I have no idea why a member of staff did that mm -hmm. some months ago. It was never drawn to my attention. I didn't approve it. I disapprove of it quite forcefully. But the reality is the Greens who are running, and when we go into Parliament, our job is to work to make democracy work better. Parliament works better when you have people who are respectful, mm -hmm who are committed, by the way, to principle. I'm not gonna trade off my kid's future for some crumbs off the table of a party that's larger. We want to ensure that we have honest, ethical, hardworking government. That's my record, I'm proud of it. Very honest, very ethical, very hardworking, and so are the other Greens who are elected in four provinces across this country. People have seen Paul Manley from Nanaimo Ladysmith and the work he does. They see the work I do. And a mistake made, and it's, a, it's an unforgivable mistake as far as that goes, by someone in communications who never talked to me about it. We're not electing the communications shop of the Green Party to government. You're electing me to be a prime minister, or you're electing, well, we don't elect prime ministers, I hasten to say, in Westminster Parliamentary Democracy, I hate it when I hear someone saying I'm running for prime minister. I'm running to be the member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands, mm -hmm. and with enough seats, I would be prime minister. But let's, as I said, in, in the realistic world of where we're headed in 2019, we need every single Green elected, as many as possible, mm -hmm. to ensure that after the election, we have people who will hold the line, ensure other parties keep their promises, and make sure that we deliver for our kids on the climate goals that we adopted in Paris. We have 30 seconds left. Um, what do you hope Canadians will consider when they head to the ballot box on October 21st? Wouldn't it be nice to be happy with the way you voted? Wouldn't you love to not feel as though, oh God, I got misled again. I believe that guy, I believe that party. I feel so let down. Mm -hmm. Feel good about your vote. Look at our platform and consider, isn't this the very best representative I could possibly have is voting to have a Green Member of Parliament?
Ms. May, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and speaking to you. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you. And good luck on the 21st. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.